Hello everyone and welcome back from your mocks. Very sorry that I can't be with you at the moment. I'm making this video to give you a few tips now as we get into completing the first draft. Remember our aim before the end of term is to finish the 1500 word draft and to go into the holiday with a clear idea of the ways in which it needs to be improved. So I'm going to start off here looking at Jana's essay. It's on T.S. Eliot's poetry. She says, T.S. Eliot paints a picture of a world in permanent decline. You'll be reminded of the fact that this is a good title because it uses an adjective which is too strong, permanent decline. Because T.S. Eliot's poetry definitely shows decline. The hedge word there, the word that we can argue against, is the idea of whether that decline is permanent or not. I'm going to look at three main things today. I'm going to be looking at signposting the question and keeping a sharp focus. And that's going to be the uh, yellow highlighted text. I'm going to be looking at AO2, language form and structure things as well. And then later on, I'm going to be looking at the green sections, which is very well integrated context and intertextual references. Okay. So straight away, like many uh, modernist poet, T.S. Eliot paints a picture of a world in permanent decline. T.S. Eliot conveys the disarray of Western society after the onset of World War I. Two things here. Disarray and permanent decline aren't quite synonyms, but they're close enough. So one of the things that you should do for your keywords is to write a list of very similar words with similar meanings. If not synonyms, then very uh, close meanings. So that your essay doesn't become too repetitive. Because whilst it's very desirable to signpost the question and to, uh, at the end of um, each paragraph and at the beginning of paragraphs, to show that you're focused on the question, it's also good to vary that vocabulary a little bit, okay? So that's the first thing. The next thing is just to remind you of how important it is to choose really good quotations, okay? Here she's using two poems, The Love Song of J. Prufrock and Portrait of a Lady, okay? Then, if we move into the first paragraph, we see she is choosing two pieces of symbolism that are really interesting. Firstly, direct eyes, okay? And secondly, hollow men. Now what you'll see here is the extended analysis. Direct indicates boldness and clarity in believers' lives, granting them a sense of purpose, juxtaposing with the paralyzed force hollow men endure life with. The oxymoron induces an atmosphere of confusion. Perhaps Eliot critiques modern nihilism and secularism. So I want you to see she's not only looking at the techniques there, she's really emphasizing the effects and the authorial intention. Why is Eliot choosing these words? How does that fit in with this title? And you can see that she has bold and assured um, interpretations of these phrases. Here again, I put this in yellow just to show you how sharply focused it is on our title. Eliot seems to represent the hollow men as microcosmic for the wider decline of post-war America and Europe. Two things here. Firstly, it sharply focuses on the question, this idea of decline and permanent decline. Secondly, this is how you use context. She skillfully integrates it. It doesn't feel like historical padding, which you often see with students who tell you like little histories of the First World War, etc. Here, it effortlessly flows with the rest of the paragraph. Notice here again. Therefore, Eliot suggests that religion may heal on an individual and societal dimension by reconstructing the damaged site of European culture. Well, if we look at our title, paints a, a, a picture of a world of permanent decline, here we see the counter thesis, religion may heal. And this is what we want to see at your essay, that their debate is at the absolute center of the essay. Notice here the clincher sentence at the end of the paragraph. The spiritual hope which Eliot believes will salvage society from atheism fades perniciously, beautiful vocabulary too, supplementing the sense of permanent decline. Again, telegraphing the question, a real sense of sharp focus on the task. In green here, I have put, 
Eliot had recently converted to the Anglican faith, the poem may embody his spiritual rebirth. You notice that the context follows the AO2. It follows the quote. It comes out of the quote. It's not surrounding or padding the quote. Another thing that's really important is it may embody. Modality and use of conditionals is very important in literature. Remember, we don't want final interpretations. Words like prove are banned in literature. Nothing is proven in literature. We can put forward readings, and that's what she does very well here. Moving on. Here she says, rediscovering Christ, indicated by the denouement of both poems. The hollow men concludes with a fragmented liturgy of For Thine Is Life. Don't forget these um, uh, backslashes here indicate line, uh, where lines are breaking. That's really important. Symbolizing disintegrating faith. Why I like this is she's not identifying structure only and feature spotting, which a lot of students do. She is identifying an element of AO2 structure and seeing how it pertains to the theme so that it is directly relevant to the question and the task. Once again, excellent clincher sentence. Notice this. Although Eliot laces hope, by advising religion as the antidote, not sure the grammar there, as the antidote for modernity and declining society, the despairing ending and the triumph of the naturalistic intellect truly portrays a world in permanent decline. Again, notice the telegraphing of the question there, how expertly it is done. An examiner reading this will think, this student is razor focused on the task. I can see that they're signaling to me all of the time. Of course, opening sentences or topic sentences are also key. Eliot's The Wasteland features Western and Eastern religions which are presented as a deliverer of solace and equipoise in a deteriorating society, thus providing hope. Notice here again, I've um, highlighted this for a particular reason. Structurally, this section reiterates the message of the Brahadida, I can't pronounce that, utilizing Indian philosophy as guidance and optimism in the labyrinthine text. Again, why I'm pointing this out is, I put it in green for the context. She's understanding why Eastern religions are brought into T.S. Eliot's um, poetry. She's placing that in her argument, which is about religion and spirituality and permanent decline. She's identifying how this particular text works on a structural level alongside T.S. Eliot's poetry. And I really want to remind you, I've put a sheet of language, form and structure into the teams. Please use it because I want you speaking about juxtaposition, antithesis, line lengths, meter types. Don't forget that this is a poetry essay. It should be littered with terms like cesora and end stopping and a jammon and quatrains. I want to see that in because the middle of your paragraph should be mainly AO2, language, form, and structure, and it should be detailed. And you should be doing that kind of swag analysis where you zoom in on particular details. But you zoom in on them and you make sure that that interpretation and analysis is directly relevant to the question at the top. That is always your key task, okay? And again, I just wanted to highlight at the end of the paragraph, the commonality between Eliot's poem is that religion is key for rejuvenating society, meaning he does not paint a world in permanent decline. Again, we see the subtle references to the title. We see that this is a complex, multi-layered argument. Here I've highlighted this section. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock flirts between romantic and realist narratives, constructing a dialectic of analogies. Well, it's a beautiful sentence for a start, but it's also a very complex point about form and about structure. These narratives are embodied in Prufrock, and he addressed himself as you and I, introducing the theme of appearance 
versus reality. So see how the structure then nicely flows into the analysis of language. And then towards the end of the paragraph, these symbols demonstrate society's obsession with materialism at detriment of fulfilling love. Indeed, this is a testament to the disillusionment of a generation and spiritual bankruptcy of the years after World War I. Again, think about the title. We then see that when she puts the context in, it's beautifully embedded within a larger argument. It also follows the AO2 language form and structure, and it comes out of it. Similarly, he is oblivious, obviously unmatched with figures like Michelangelo as Prufrock loses in social Darwinianism. You know, social Darwinianism we've covered in Streetcar, the survival of the fittest, and sexual selection, which is a demonstrated in his hair growing thin. Why I've chosen this is, look, the context is supported by a quotation. We can see that the context is closely embedded in the analysis of the poem itself. It's not padding, it's really integrated. Unlike Prufrock, Portrait of a Lady features less fear and approaching others for love, permitting readers to witness an interaction between a man and a woman. Why I've chosen that is to show you how carefully she signals the content of that paragraph. It's going to be about the dynamic between men and women, romance and sexuality, or in Prufrock's case, the lack thereof. Very useful intertextual reference to Romeo and Juliet. In many of your poems, poets will allude to other poems. Make sure that that could follow your AO2 and it could then be classed as a kind of context which adds to the meaning of poems. Intertextuality is often a very important device used in poetry and, of course, in prose at times. And I want to look at the whole conclusion because it's so good. Eliot articulates a beautiful pluralistic tone about his poetry. Well, all poetry is pluralistic, and I want you to realize that all poetry can be read in different ways. And that's what you want to get across in your essay, is that they're competing readings. And in the conclusion, you're going to come down on the side of one, or you might say it's perfectly balanced between these two. But the important thing is to make sure whatever that question was at the top, that, or whatever the statement was at the top, that you come back to it and you synthesize the essay in the conclusion and you answer the task that you were set. While Eliot's milieu seems largely cynical, hope comes in the form of religious, literary and historical allusions. A modern reader, very useful to distinguish between modern and contemporary readers, between meanings at the time of writing and the way in which we consume this text, often very, very different. And don't forget to talk about that. The context of reception, how we read the text and where we read the text will help to determine the meaning of the text. Yeah, A modern reader may interpret Eliot's writing as overwhelmingly cynical due to his reactionary nature, which may deviate from aspects of the 21st century radicalism. In this sense, Eliot could be viewed as painting a world in permanent decline. That's so good, isn't it? Because she says, this is one way, and then here's our key word, however. Under the guise of the imagery of decline and futility, there is invariable hope that guides those who desire enlightenment. My only slight little criticism there would be that that word permanent is so important in the title that it might have been a good idea to have put it here, just so that the examiner could see that you're going to dispute this idea that that decline is permanent. Look here, I just wanted you to see that she has a nice bibliography, and that this bibliography here, these critics, are really carefully woven into the argument. You don't always need to name the critics. You can use them in your footnotes if you so wish. So really good luck with this first draft. I hope that that was a useful video. To sum up, really careful, sharp focus on the title. The words of the title used throughout the essay. 
make sure that the middle, the kind of meat of the burger, is always AO2 analysis, that you're covering language, form, and structure. Use the terminology by all means, but what is really key is the effect of the technique and what the writer is seeking to do with this particular technique. That really should be the pith of each and every paragraph. Please make sure that the context follows AO2, that it's really carefully integrated. Intertextuality can be very useful, as we've seen, if it's relevant to your poet. Don't forget, lots of devices, jamon, quatrains, and all of the other terms that we've covered. And when you come to the conclusion, as you see on this screen now, make sure that you directly answer that question, that you synthesize your argument and you show the complexity of the debate, but you also clearly answer it and come out on one side. Best of luck, and I hope to see you soon.